A group of kids at a cyber cafe or university uh, computer lab can download a gigabyte an hour. If, for example, a cyber cafe or school uses a satellite dish designed for small office applications, the bill at the end of the month may be unbelievable. Cable TV or CATV is a very popular in many countries. In fact, in some countries, for example, in Argentina, there are more TV sets than telephones. CATV has the ability to download broadband internet, but Many systems are not designed for upstream two-way operation. They must rely upon a dial-up connection for the request link back to the head end. Typical download speeds run 400 kilobits, which is noticeably better than dial-up modem and quite satisfactory for the major uh, majority of users. Cable companies are at a disadvantage since they compete directly with a local telephone company which often is the only source of broadband internet in the region. A direct satellite connection to the backbone can alleviate this problem and make them independent of local issues. ICCA TV is playing a major role in local internet connectivity. The price of receiving internet service through CATV ranges from $40 to $70 per month. The cable modem costs around $400, and can often be included in the monthly fee. Wireless local distribution generally falls into two categories, mobile and fixed. Most digital or PCS cell phones offer an email option for about $3 per month. Since this system is optimized for digital voice, the download speed is only 4.8 kilobits. A great deal of work is going on into ways to access web pages over this limited bandwidth. A technology called CDPD offers higher bandwidth, but cellular companies have been reluctant to make the capital investment that is required at each cell site. Companies like Metrocom offer wireless DSL to laptops at a cost similar to cable modems. But here again, the capital cost to cover a city is significant and this type of service is available only in major markets. Wireless cable TV, or MMDS, like its wired uh, cousin, can provide rapid download capability at a cost similar to CATV. The most promising wireless solution at this time is the unlicensed 2.4 gigahertz spread spectrum equipment, which is in volume production and the cost of the subscriber terminal is expected to drop rapidly. A central node can reach users within a five kilometer range with bandwidths up to two E1s per users. This bandwidth can be channelized and shared by several users. A subscriber modem and rooftop antenna that will handle an E1 and 16 separate addresses is about $1,500 it is expected that a single user device will soon be available for under $500. Plugins for student laptops are under $80, $180, but have a limited range, which is still quite adequate for campus networks. The monthly charges range from $50 for a single user to $400 a month for a multi-user business. Download speeds per user are typically 400 kilobits per second. A satellite network's ability to instantly and simultaneously broadcast web content to multiple points around the world has been combined with local caching of the most frequently used content and a fiber backbone. This provides random access to less frequently used web content to form a high efficiency content delivery network that overcomes many of the limitations of the original internet. This model, when combined with wireless, high-speed, local distribution, generates an entirely new and exciting user experience, such as we have seen in the classroom for the 21st century, which I'll talk about shortly. Let's take a look at the real-world example of how fiber, satellite, and wireless last-mile distribution can be combined to provide a cost-efficient way to provide high-performance Internet connectivity to a community. Ensenada in Baja, California, Mexico, is a community of about 400,000 inhabitants. 
W4 teamed with a local partner to install and now operates a 2.4 meter two-way satellite earth station, wireless metropolitan area network, and connectivity to the regional fiber network for regional access. These facilities you see in this photo are located on a hill overlooking the city. This view from the wireless tower, which provides line of sight coverage to 80% of the businesses and schools and cyber cafes in the community. The wireless metropolitan area network operates at 10 megabits per second, giving any one client up to two E1s if required. Most citizens utilize 512 kilobits. By using a central satellite hub and wireless last mile kilo, uh, distribution, one is able to incorporate sophisticated internet data processing and storage, which dramatically improves the end user's experience and cuts the long-term operating costs in a way that makes quality internet affordable on the local economy. The result is that a local subscriber anywhere in the world can experience the same level of service that is available in large U.S. cities. Let's now look at how this is internet delivery network can be used to improve the quality of K through 12 education. During the 1999-2000 school year, W4 funded an, an experiment called the Classroom for the 21st Century. To see what the impact would be on students in a rural school if they had access to high quality internet as part of their learning experience. W4 installed a satellite delivery system and built a state of the art internet classroom with 30 computers and a large screen projection system at Mountain Empire School District near the U.S. Mexican border. Students who were selected at random studied history, English, math, and other subjects for a year. At the end of each school year, California students take the Stanford Achievement Test called SAT-9. The results proved far more significant than originally anticipated. With a dramatic rise in the test scores of lower tier students, students that were underachievers became engaged by access to high performance computers and the internet. As you can see from this graph, all the lower tier students in classroom 21 moved into the mid-range, scoring as much as 30% higher than their peers who were without access to the learning resources of the Internet. These types of results can be extended to the university campus. According to a recent report by the German Information Agency, Latin America has a population of about 424 million people with 6.2 million students in public universities on 682 campuses. Of these, only 4% have access to adequate internet service. Keep in mind that this means what this means in the information age. Each graduating class with limited internet access has diminished chances of competing successfully in the 21st century economy. From its satellite hub atop the San Diego supercomputer, my company W4, is working to give universities and corporations around the world the best internet-based resources possible. Currently, W4 serves the American continent by SatMex5 and NuelSat satellites offering collaborative exchange, on-campus caching of academic content, while concurrently giving the faculty and, research and researchers and students alike direct access to the high-speed academic internets as well as to the public web. This service is called the America's Network. Most researchers today have to fight their way through the congested public web to reach the resources of VBNS and Internet2 and the other research-orientated branches of the Internet. W4 provides direct connectivity to the resources of the San Diego Supercomputer Center. This includes over one petabyte of scientific data, some of the world's largest computing resources, and enormous connectivity to all of the .com and .ed and .org uh, strands of the web. It also provides connectivity to numerous other academic links, such as to the major U.S. Tier 1 Internet providers. 
These resources are accessible over SatMax 5 anywhere in the Americas and on NoelSat in Argentina and Mercosur. One of the universities currently benefiting from the resources of the Americas Network is the University Autonoma of Baja California in Mexico. With a dish on the roof, 3,000 students and 900 faculty have direct access to the Internet backbone at over 1,200 computers at their computer science center. In summary, it is imperative that each of you as managers and users of information see that your organization and staff are well trained, equipped, and have high quality connectivity to information sources like the internet so they may participate in the information age and compete successfully in the 21st century economy. The global telecommunications networks of today will increasingly be a hybrid mix of wired and wireless connections using fiber and satellite for long-haul connectivity and digital copper DSL and ISDN for local distribution with an overlay of wireless solutions such as microwave and spread spectrum in metropolitan area networks. The growing availability of broadband widths in the United States, Europe, the Pacific Rim, and other regions of the world will allow participants in the information age to enjoy instant exchange of information with their colleagues no matter where they are or no matter how many borders separate them from each other. Interactive video collaboration and training will become commonplace in universities, businesses, and even at home. The cost will become insignificant since it will be just part of the basic connectivity cost one has to the Internet. The key is to set a priority on participating in the information age and its facilitator, the Internet. The technology is available to you today. Your challenge is to optimize the telecommunications connectivity resources available to you and invest wisely in connectivity resources to ensure your future and the competitiveness of your organization. Thank you very much. Let's begin with the first question and answer session. We're going to try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that you only ask one question per phone call, and these be as brief as possible. You may call the studio directly at the phone numbers or facts which appear on the screen. We remember uh, that you make your phone calls at a distance from the monitor to avoid feedback. Uh, our first question is uh, a fax uh, from Finalco in Medellin, Colombia. And uh, the question is, we're in the inland portion of our country. Uh, why is it so difficult to get a fast Internet connection here? Well, Peter, uh, most of the Internet connectivity uh, in Latin America is provided by submarine fiber optic cable to the coastal cities. From there, it enters a gateway and goes into the public switched telephone network. And <clears throat> this network is really optimized for uh, telephone communications, not necessarily Internet. And there may not be the proper equipment. There may be the technicians are really trained as telephone technicians, not as internet uh, specialists. So that um, by the time the, the signal is arrives at, at their location in the inland, uh, there's a number of things can happen, particularly oversubscription, where there's, the network is crowded because there just isn't enough bandwidth allocated to internet today. Would wireless broadcasting be a solution to this? Yes. Uh, wireless in the sense that if you classify satellite as wireless, okay. uh, the way to bypass the entire problem is to come directly from the backbone of the Internet and go to a dish on the roof of your facilities. And that gives you a single one-hop connection to the Internet backbone, uh, a one-hop answer to the problem. Okay. Well, I have another fax here uh, from uh, Univa in uh, 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 Michoacan, Mexico. And uh, the question is, I am involved with agriculturally produced exports. Why is it so important for us to be proficient in the use of the Internet? Well, used to, uh, one could 
uh, grow a crop and sell it to a wholesaler and it really didn't, uh, you didn't have very much involvement in the overall process. Well, today, if you can get on the Internet and find the spot uh, price for the product that you're producing, if you can get on the Internet, find out what current shipping uh, costs are, the availability of transportation, you can dramatically change the profit margin on your product. Uh, Mark, do you have anything to add to that? Not really. I think that we're, uh, that we're really looking at connectivity, and it's the applications and solutions that run in the, uh, on the Internet and the connections that uh, we really are looking at for in terms of productivity improvements. So we'll work into that later in the program. Excellent. Um, now we have a phone call uh, from Universidad de Sonora in Hermosillo, uh, Sonora, Mexico. Go ahead. Buenos días. Greetings to all the whole ITC network. Our question is the following. I believe the whole infrastructure, the technology, the knowledge, and all the resources in order to establish connectivity and to offer a service using these communication technologies, telecommunications, it for everyone is definitely available. I believe that the greatest challenge would be rather to have to be able to offer access to the great majority of population who really has no access to technology. What strategies do you, uh, Mr. Johnson, recommend with regard to providing through a coordination, a concerted effort between government, public sector, private sector, higher education, to offering Internet services to this, or telecommunication services to this great majority of population. What, what do you suggest? I think that's the challenge. Thank you. Oh, Walter, that's well, an interesting one. Go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you for the question. It turns out there is a phenomenon developing within Latin America that you don't see here in North America. It's known as a cyber cafe. It is a common ground where young people, uh, older people, can all come together and learn together how to work with computers, work with the Internet. Uh, they can range from doing their Word documents or X, uh, Excel spreadsheets to actually getting on and doing research on the Internet. And what we're finding is that cyber cafes are the real uh, entry point for the Internet to people that don't have uh, access to Internet home, don't have a computer. A young person can save up a dollar, dollar and a half, and go down and spend an hour at a cyber cafe. And it, 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 they have no long-term obligation. They have immediate access to the Internet. And uh, so it's just like going to the movies. See. Mark, uh, obviously this relates to the whole issue of the digital divide. Any insights on how to close that either here in the United States or internationally? Well, I think that uh, some of the devices that um, we're looking at being in the future, they're going to be smaller and uh, not as expensive and they'll be more efficient on the network. You know, some of the um, IP telephones, things that we'll talk about in the next segment, those, those will help close the digital divide because they will, they'll be cheaper and they'll be more available. But right now, I think this, the idea of having places where people can congregate is actually a fairly good move in that um, it forms a different kind of community. So, um, you know, th this is just part of the ongoing push out of new technology and there's going to be a little bit of a lag we see that I, I should add that one of the things San Diego State University is doing is uh, uh, attempting to open uh, community centers uh, at schools and uh, at uh, abandoned factory buildings in the, some of the poorest neighborhoods of San Diego that's an initiative by uh, the International Center for Communication and uh, having having some success in getting more people online uh, now we have a uh, question, I believe, from Santo Domingo. Go ahead, please. Yes. From the Naval Academy of the Dominican Republic, the communication is bad. It's cut. It's... We want to talk about security and transmission of information. Security. Gentlemen, what about it? Is Internet 
secure medium? It can be. Uh, there, all of the encryption and scrambling techniques for data can be applied to the data prior to entering the Internet, so it can be just as secure as any other uh, form of communications. Mark, uh, up in the Silicon Valley, there are at least a uh, few people that are hackers or terrorists that uh, attempt to get on these networks. Uh, can we really protect ourselves against these kind of individuals? Well, this is a, a new kind of, of threat, um, and Cisco is taking it very seriously. I mean, we have just uh, announced a new virtual private network um, uh, piece of software, and it allows you to um, have an encrypted password. It's a dynamic password so that it constantly changes. Um, the, actually, the application is called so Soft Token. But then um, it allows you to tunnel in as though you have a virtual private network. And that tunneling in not only gives you security, but it also um, gives you what we call quality of service levels. So that when you do tunnel in, you've been guaranteed a certain amount of bandwidth so that you can conduct, conduct your business. It is an issue that we're always watching. And I think that that's going to be a growing uh, part of the entire industry is to continue to upgrade security encryptions and to stay ahead of the hackers. Yep. I just loaded new uh, antivirus software on my computer this week, as a matter of fact. Uh, now we have um, a, uh, a caller from Universidad de Occidente in uh, Los Mochis, Sinaloa, in Mexico. Go ahead, please. Sí, gracias. Good, mo buenos días. Good morning. If information is today a very strategic resource, therefore what makes the organization competitive is precisely information. So the question, how can we, how can we prevent monopolies from people from monopolizing information? That's an interesting one. How about monopolies? Is, is the trend toward... Uh, even more startups and more small companies, or is the trend toward monopolistic uh, uh, concentration? I can't tell. Well, I think the, the basic underlying uh, architecture of the Internet is for mass sharing of information. I mean, it's amazing what you can find out about a company today, about a product. Uh, and with the advent of uh, low-cost storage, it's possible for people to store large volumes of information either on their PC or in a central storage uh, location that is local. So they can accumulate a huge library. So I think the move actually is the other, uh, the other direction. Uh, I call it the beehive effect, that you can put information out there and there's just thousands of people will contribute just because they enjoy contributing their knowledge and their resources to others in the, in the world. What about it, Mark? More new sources of uh, information and in startups or more concentration of information and in takeovers? Well, that's a good question. I, you know, if you really look at what, uh, what may be the trend for large industries, I mean, I, I could imagine that if you look at uh, a, a traditional industry like um, aircraft production, you might find that, that, that the knowledge and technical um, specifications within that, that uh, industry could get more concentrated and, less, and flow uh, less fle freely. But, you know, as Walter was saying, the ideal or the idea is that people are building on new ideas. So if you have these beehives, you're really not talking about people being able to hold on to, um, you know, uh, the, the ideas that are being born out in a people's consciousness and then sharing across the net. And I think that's where we're going to see the huge leap forward in terms of e-learning and the other, um, you know, future uh, growth of human development. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Badger. Let me make one final please, comment. Please, please. People uh, see things like, or I see things like uh, MIT, putting their entire undergraduate coursework on the ne network at no charge. Now, can you imagine the resources that the, the value of that resource that they've made available publicly? Huge. So, it's, it's, it, to me, it's moving towards uh, open communications. Okay. 
Uh, now we have another uh, phone caller from uh, Colombia, from the uh, Federación Nacional de Comerciantes in Medellín. Go ahead, please, Finalco. Muy buenos días. Buenos días. Development and technological advances that have had as a motivating factor saving time to the user has still generating individualism and has absorbed the person completely. Is this a normal process or do you think this, this should be corrected somehow? In this case, what would you think would be the medicine or the remedy for this individualism generated? Mark, is this uh, creating individualism or, uh, in a sense, is it creating community? What do you think about that? Well, uh, yeah, let me make sure I understand the question. Can you, can you uh, rephrase it or uh, restate it? Medellin, are you still there? Bien, podría reformar. Thank you. The development. Hello? Yes, sí, sí, adelante. The development and technological advances have had as a motivating factor the fact to save time for man and facilitate things for man. However, this has also generated some individualism and has absorbed the person. Is this a normal kind of process or do you think do, this, is not, this is an aberration and should be remedied? If, we, if you think we really ought to remedy this situation, this indiv highly individual uh, attitude, what would be the remedies you would suggest? What a fascinating question. I think that, um, that this, is, um, this is very insightful. You know, um, when people looked at the idea that they would be able to spread their, um, their ability to collect new ideas and that we were going to have a collective um, consciousness, and, and that's the move that and the, some of the promises that were made when, when people talked about, you know, communities and extended uh, uh, collaboration, that now we're seeing that people are actually you know, uh, marketing their ideas is individualistic, but it's built on the sum total of everybody else's uh, ideas. I remember attending a lecture with uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, who said that scholarship is the plagiarism of yours and everybody else's ideas. And I think that that is, um, you know, we may be going through a period where the uh, technologies have increased the demand on individuals because it's not making labor any easier. It's just causing people to work more. And as they do that, they're actually building a new set of, um, you know, intellectual ca capital tools or in a, in a new um, sort of uh, collect uh, collateral that they can exchange, and it is making them more individualistic. So... Whether this is a you know just an epic or a move or a, a you know a stage, I don't know, but um, certainly um, that is uh, what's happening now, and and I think it's particularly happening as the economy shifts, where you know th when things were very very good, it was all a grand idea to be collective and highly collaborative. As things get tighter, people see that the old style of, you know, I'm only as good as my ideas and I have to keep them close to me and I will give them away as part of my exchange so that I maintain my worthiness is emerging. So whether you can divorce human nature from it all, it, it remains to be seen. Thanks, Mark. I think Walter and I want to take a stab at this question, too. Go ahead, Walter. Hey, I, I, again, I, let me comment. Uh, this is a very, very insightful question because it's a, a real problem for management. Um, in my own company, I've had a situation where the sales manager got on the computer and he learned to do PowerPoint presentations, etc. And what happened is the computer became the goal, not the sales. <laughs> and people get so engrossed uh, with the computer, they forget what their real job is. And so I think it is a management challenge to uh, reinforce what the real goals are and to, to encourage people to treat the information age as a tool. Absolutely. Yeah, the, you know, the computer is not an end 
in itself, it's a portal, it's a mechanism to enable you to do other things. And uh, this is a culture, this is a, a question of culture as well as of technology. You know, the United States is a very individualistic culture. Uh, many of the countries, certainly in South America, are much more collectivistic. And it may be that the Internet uh, creates different outcomes in Latin America than it will in the United States. Uh, it may allow you to create new communities that are virtual communities across distance uh, without the necessity for being face to face. And given some of the large distances in many countries, uh, this may actually cause more collaboration and less individualism. But it's always uh, a challenge to see which direction it moves in.